Welcome to The Chase Hudson Show, a podcast dedicated to inspiring you to become extraordinary. Each week, we sit down with top-tier business owners, real estate investors, and influencers to inspire you to build your legacy. It's time to level up. Welcome to another episode of The Chase Hudson Show. Today, we have McKay Christensen, who is a business leader, author, professor, and podcast host. He is currently the CEO of a major nonprofit organization, Thanksgiving Point, based in Lehigh, Utah, and has spent time at various organizations in in very high-level positions, uh, most recently with Melaleuca as the chief strategy officer and president. Uh, McKay is a PhD, has incredible knowledge to share, uh, it's it's really a fascinating fascinating episode. Um, we get we get to learn a lot from McKay. So, looking forward to diving in. And with that, let's do it. All right, welcome to another episode of the Chase Hudson Show. Today in the studio we have McKay Christensen. I'm honored to have you have you here, McKay. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I'm going to give a quick quick bio on McKay, and then we'll we'll jump into this. So. McKay is a business leader, author, professor, and podcast host. He's currently the CEO of a major nonprofit organization, Thanksgiving Point, which serves children and youth in his local community. McKay's career began at Procter & Gamble after graduating with an MBA and a master's in accounting from BYU. He's held various other leadership positions in business, including director of strategic planning at Hollywood World- Holiday Worldwide, president and chief strategy officer for Melaleuca, Inc., and Managing Director of Advancement at BYU. McKay earned a PhD in adult organization learning and teaches business strategy at BYU's Merritt School of Business. He co-authored the book, Open Your Eyes, and also hosts a weekly podcast by the same name, which focuses on helping people discover steps to lasting change on their path to personal growth and development. With that, McKay, welcome. Thank you. I'm, it's my pleasure to be here. Excited to be on the podcast, and I love what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Trying to just be like you, man. Oh, I mean, no, not even close. I've been listening to your podcast. It's it's awesome, and we'll we'll jump into that. Um, well, the first thing I usually ask McKay is is kind of to, to describe your upbringing and your childhood. Um, you've been very successful. You're an author, PhD. What what was it perhaps about your your childhood or, or early years that helped mold you into the man you are today? Everybody always says I grew up a poor child, right? But it really was true in my case. I had seven brothers and sisters, eight kids in our household. Wow. Uh, We grew up fairly poor. Uh, I had to work from an early age. Uh, I think that work ethic developed during that time frame for me. Uh, And I found that I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the game of business. I liked the strategy of it. I had great mentors when I was younger. So I had great opportunity to learn and grow in jobs that uh, typical youth didn't get a chance to do. And uh, uh, it was it was really helpful for me to see successful business people early on in my life. And so early on in life, I said, this is what I want to do. So when I went to school, there really was no question of what I wanted to do. I wanted to do business and strategy. And, and uh, that's kind of where I ended up. That's great. And I read somewhere in one of, in one of your bios that you had an, an accident when you were in your younger years. And is that something you would feel comfortable talking about? Maybe how that, I don't know if, if that was something that perhaps help define you or mentally or, or overcoming, you know, a challenge that, that, that you face there. If you, if you want to dive in there. It was huge for me. It was a, it was a defining moment of my life. You know, just to take a step back, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel is this famous activist. He was alongside Martin Luther King. He went, marched in Selma And he was a constructionist, a psychologist, a constructionist, which means he believes that the words that we create, we use in life, create our worlds. In fact, he coined the phrase, words create worlds. And the reason is because when he was born in Germany, it was actually Poland, uh, his parents were killed by the Nazis. He escaped in 1938, came to New York, and there he became a seminarian training rabbis because he believed that the whole Nazi movement started with words. It was propaganda, and it was words that came long before the crematoria and concentration camps. So he was deeply passionate about this principle and taught it and believed that if if we could begin 
to articulate and communicate with each other that we could form a different world here in our country. Mm. And I found that was true in my experience when I was younger. So when I was 15 years old, I was working on a sod farm, you know, sod where you Mm -hmm. cut grass up and you bring it to your house and you have grass automatically where we were on a big 14 ton harvester. And that harvester had two sets of of wheels, dual wheels on each side of the rear of the harvester, huge four wheels on each side. And there was a platform over each of those wheels. And we were working, standing on those platforms as the sod would come off the top of the machine, we would stack it on pallets. So large harvester, 14 ton driver was 15, 20 feet ahead of us. Couldn't see us. And we were moving this harvester from one end of the field to the other one morning. My friend was sitting on top of that platform with his legs hanging over the side of the wheels, and I was walking alongside, and I thought I'd jump up and sit next to him. So I turned my back butt first. I jumped up onto the platform, jumped too far, landed on the platform, bounced off, and and landed in front of the wheels. Wow. As I went to escape and step out of the way, uh, the wheels caught my foot and threw me onto my side. So here I am now, I'm lying on my side, the machine is going to run up my feet, up my legs, up my entire body, up to my head. There's nothing I can do about it. It has me in its grip. And I, as it ran over my knee and got past my knee, it crushed my femur. As I got to my pelvis, it turned my pelvis and crushed it together turned me sideways, broke my back in two places, and then broke all, almost all of my ribs, all but three, as it ran off and missed my head just by inches oh as it ran God. off. Wow. I passed out. And a few minutes later, uh, when I came to, uh, the pain was more than I could stomach or stand. Everything hurt. Uh, and it was, yes, my broken bones, but my lungs had collapsed. So the air had left my lungs and was now in my chest cavity and couldn't escape. So it was pressuring my lungs together and keeping them from expanding. So my w- lungs are stuck together like a wet paper sack. And in order to breathe, I have to create more room in my chest cavity, but all my ribs are broken. And I don't know if you've ever not been able to breathe. Everything hurts. Your brain, your heart your muscles are all screaming for oxygen. And in this state, I just knew I was dead. I didn't ever have the thought in my mind that I was going to live. I was just thinking to myself, how long will this last until I close my eyes and I'm done? Uh, It had been, I was in shock, obviously. The machine had run over me. It was heavy. It was awful. And um, just then Stan, the farm manager, came up. Now, Stan just knelt down beside me, and he just started to talk to me. And I don't know what possessed him to do, to, to do this, but it was, it was remarkable. And he just started to make statements like, McKay, you're going to walk again. McKay, you're going to graduate from high school. McKay, you're going to have children. You're going to get married. And he started to make these proclamations about my life as if, he was forecasting something. And inside of me, there was this tug of war that was going on. Like the one side of me was saying, hurry up and die because the pain's so much. But then when Stan would speak to me, I would latch on to his words and it would kinda, I'd kind of say to myself, okay, I can hold on for 30 seconds. And then when he'd say, make another proclamation, I thought, okay, I can hold on for two minutes. And this tug of war was going on as Stan was talking. Uh, and sure enough, I mean, I'm here today, so it worked, right? But, but I survived and I had to re- go through a lot of therapy and a lot of other things to recover and learn to walk again and all of those other things that I had to do in life. Um, but I learned a really, really good lesson and it came really to me the strongest. A few years later, when I graduated from MBA school, I got my dream job, which was to be a marketer for Procter & Gamble. And I remember my first day at work and I parked across the freeway in Mount Adams at Cincinnati and I was walking over to P&G's headquarters and I had my new suit on and I had my briefcase. There was nothing in it, but I had my briefcase and I was all proud that I had done it. I had, I had finished my education. I had reached my goal and this was a big moment, you know, and I'm walking along and my head is kind of down. 
Um, and I'm looking at my feet as I'm walking along like this. And all of a sudden I re- remembered, I noticed I was walking. And I remembered the words that Stan had said that you'll walk again and you'll graduate from school and you'll do all these, these things. And I thought his words have really become my life, right? And I thought, I think about them often. And, and I've learned that words can create worlds. And if you say, okay, let's say all of that is true, and I believe it is. Yes, the words that we use with others is really important, and the words we choose to use, but the words we use with ourselves are critically important because the words we use with ourselves can and do create worlds as well. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, McKay. I know it's probably not the easiest thing to talk about, such a a traumatic experience, but it sounds like incredible lessons came from that and endurance and and ability to, like you said, take words and positive affirmations and turn them into reality. Who's, you know, sitting, sitting across from me today. So that's amazing. Um, Thank you. Well, moving. And where did you grow up? What, uh, what part of where were you? Where are you located? My, in high school, I went to American Fork. I'm an American okay. Fork caveman. Nice. Awesome. I was in Alta, Alta High there School. There you go. Alta Hawk. So, there you go. Uh, right, right nearby. Um, okay. That's amazing. Um, moving from childhood into, into college. So you, <clears throat> did you do BYU for your undergrad? I did. Okay. So, yeah, take us through your c- kind of college early career. Um, what was your mindset going into school and what was your goal coming out of undergrad and, uh, and, and where did that proceed to? My goal going into school was to learn all I could and to become the most prepared. Uh, I'd seen business people, as I mentioned, most of my life. I had a pretty good idea of what I wanted to do. And uh, I really wanted to just, you know, suck the marrow out of school to do the very best I could to become who I could become. And the teachers that I had had a great impact on me. I was one of the students that wasn't so worried about grades as I was about learning. And as a result, I think I got more out of the classes than most. Uh, and it, they, they really were definitional for me in my life. Uh, and so I went on and got my MBA and master's in accounting together at BYU. And that was a really good move. I got a good foundation of the language of business and how to, how to, how to you know, think critically and to analyze and to and to approach business in the right way. One day I had a, uh, my last class actually of my MBA school, uh, the professor said, look, you can bring your spouse if you're married or if not bring a, a you know, friend or a partner, whatever, and, and, and they can attend this class with you. And uh, Professor Aldred got us into the class and he sat us down and he, the whole class was just life principles. And so each, each class period, we just learned life principles. One I remember one day was he got us into class and he taught us about money management. No, I'd had plenty of classes on money management, but this was about us. And he said, look, I want you to commit to this, uh, that you won't use debt except for school or for a home. And otherwise you won't buy it unless you can pay cash for it. My wife and I were there. We talked about it after class, and we said, okay, we're going to commit to that. So we got a job in Cincinnati. We got a town home when we got there, and we had no money, no furniture, nothing. So we went down to the appliance store, and we needed a washer and dryer. And I remember the two of us standing in front of the brand-new, shiny, white washer and dryer set that we were going to buy, and... She looked at me and I looked at her and we knew we couldn't buy it unless we had cash for it. So we wandered down to the secondhand store and there was a green washer and a non-matching yellow dryer. (laughs) And we bought those. They were like 25 bucks a piece. Nice. And to help ourselves, to console ourselves, we said, we're going to keep, we're going to keep these as long as they work. But the minute that they break down, we're going to go buy a washer and dryer. So for 10 years, those things worked. I never could buy a new one. (laughs) But Jen and I stuck to that uh, our entire life. Uh, and at the age of 34, she and I were entirely out of debt. Wow. And we've never had debt ever since in our lifetime. Wow. And that was a huge blessing. The words and the lesson that that professor gave to us that we laid hold of 
now today has been a huge benefit to us and has changed the course of our life, really. That's great. And and sorry if I missed it, that's ex- is that excluding primary residence or home? Or we are 100%, 100% debt-free. debt-free. Yeah. That's amazing. Because what we found was we got along with less, and the principles that we learned fueled our desire to get out of debt entirely. Mm -hmm. So we paid extra on our mortgage payment. We set things aside. We got disciplined in how we managed our money. And uh, so, yeah, at age 34, we made our last mortgage payment. We haven't had one since. Wow. And if you can imagine, I'm 58 now, from 34 to 58 to have the cash flow, then to be able to turn and invest in other things has been Mm -hmm. a huge blessing. Yeah, That's great. And and I I love that principle, I think there's plenty of people who would disagree with that, right? But it it comes back to, I think a lot of it is, you know, how you feel about debt personally um, and comfort level and sense of security. Like my parents, similar mindset, um, would love to be just completely debt-free, house is paid off. And and then you look on the other side of the spectrum, it's like, people never pay off your house. You should lever that thing up and then go invest that money into something else, you know? But it, it's all, um, I don't think there's one perfect way to do it. I think it all depends on how you feel about your sense of security, your sense of financial security and well-being. But that's amazing that you guys have been able to do that. Um, people, kudos people, to you. People ask me all the time, doesn't the good investment advisor say, do like you say, use that money, sure. leverage a tax advantage uh, borrowing if you can mm-hmm. so that you can maximize your return? And I get it. I oh, get yeah. that 100%. There's just... There's just something fundamental uh, and uh, about being out of debt and turning your cash flow to investing and saving and doing good. Yeah, 100%. I love that. Um, so you come out of BYU. Your first job was at Procter & Gamble. Yes. Um, out in Ohio. Is that in Cincinnati, right? Ohio. Okay. So how, how long were you there? Um, how was that experience? And then later, did you go later to get an MBA? Maybe walk us No, through. I had my MBA oh, you came prior out. to P&G. Okay. So, wow, nice. I worked on Sure and Secret deodorant brands. Okay. Uh, and that was a great experience. I learned how to build brands. I learned how to run business from the very best in the world. Uh, I worked on the old Spice Acquisition. Nice. So it's a good one. I'll tell you a quick story about that. So one of our assignments was to go to New York, do the due diligence. We were buying the brand from Shulton. Shulton had milked this brand for 15 years. They hadn't put any advertising into it for five or seven. The, it was just this old brand with these old uh, Christmas packs where you could buy deodorant and fragrances together. And uh, they had this old commercial of this sailor coming home from the sea, and, and it, it was a pretty bad brand. And P&G was struggling because they were losing the battle to Gillette, who wasn't owned by P&G at the time. Mm. Me, uh, Gillette was killing them in the men's skincare business. So we did our due diligence. We went to New York. We pulled people off the street to see if they had recall on the advertising done seven years, eight years ago. They did. Perfect recall. The brand was strong. The product was horrible. Uh, and so we went back and our recommendation to the CEO when we met was don't buy this brand. Mm. If you want to have the number one men's young men's skincare brand in the world, uh, this is not the one. The name itself is old spice Mm. and everything about it is dated. I think you could, we could, you could find a better brand. So he listened to our presentation and when we were done, he said, no, we're going to buy it. And in five years, Old Spice will be the best-selling men's skincare brand in the world. Wow. And uh, he, claim. he took it. And sure enough, today, Old Spice is exactly that. <laughs> and I learned a really good lesson because he had been down that path before dozens of times. He had done it with Name Your Brand, Tide, Cheer, um, you know, all the pampers. He'd been down over and over again and they had acquired brands and he had seen their talent and ability to take brands, turn them around, create a new brand proposition and become number one in the marketplace. They had done it over and over again. And because he'd seen that before, he knew he could make the decision and and do this well. Right. I learned a really good lesson that it isn't all analytics. Yeah. It's also experience and uh, talent that you got to make the decisions with. I love that. That's great. And, and so true. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, in spreadsheets <laughs> and looking at numbers and 
and uh, sometimes getting out and looking at something and, and having a gut feel and just seeing multiple reps, it, it goes uh, a lot further than just the number sometimes. So I agree. Well, that's great. Um, okay, so you're, you're at Procter & Gamble. How long were you there, and then what, what came next? I was there five years. I was approached by a recruiter to go be the head of strategic planning for Holiday Inn Worldwide, the hotelier. Okay. Uh, we had about 2,500 properties worldwide. I thought it was an opportunity to step out and, and, and take a strategy job, which was really my dream. Mm. And uh, so I went to Holiday Inn and really learned international business. A lot of it was international in scope, a lot of the property acquisition. We had about 180 uh, uh, company-owned properties around the world. We grew that. We had about 2,200 or so um, franchise properties. I learned the franchise business, and that was a really good experience for me. That's great. I was there for several years, and then my uh, a, a person that I had gotten to know in, in Cincinnati was the COO of the parent company of LensCrafters. Mm. So he called me on the phone and asked me to come up and run one of their business units. At the time, they were the largest apparel, footwear, and eyewear retailer in the world. So um, I got to go and work with him on, uh, we had 4,600 retail properties around the country, a number of different operations. And I was their head of operations and finance. Wow. So those are some, those are some big time positions that you held. Good um, experience. Yeah. Really good experience. And then did you kind of parlay that into the Melaleuca role? Was that the next? Yeah. Uh, I, I went to work one day uh, and the, co- the parent company of LensCrafters was named U.S. Shoe Corporation because they started as a shoe company. Okay. And uh, I showed up at work one day and found out that there was a tender offer on, all stri- on Wall Street for all of our shares. This company out of Italy, Luxottica, uh, had off- made a cash offer, several billion dollars for the company, uh, because they were the supplier of our eyewear frames, and we had just made the decision to make them ourselves, and they didn't like that. Mm-hmm. So they bought the company, sold off all the parts, and uh, it was then that... I said, hey, I'll look for a job, and uh, I ended up in Idaho Falls, Idaho, of all places, president of a small $200 million company, and uh, I was there for the next uh, 18 years. Tell us a little about, about Melaleuca. So I, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar, but for those who aren't, what what is the, what is Melaleuca? What did you guys do? And um, We're a direct-to-consumer retailer of personal care and home care products. Products you clean your house with, shampoos, soaps, um, uh, skin care, cosmetics, uh, a, a host of products, about 400 different types, you know, SKUs in the product line. And uh, long before there was the internet or Amazon, we sold to direct con- to consumers online. Mm. So consumers come, they shop directly, uh, the way we attract customers, however, is that when someone refers you, if I were to refer you to shop and you go shop online, when you shop online, you give the company my number, and every time you shop, I earn a commission. Okay. So it's a referral marketing driven company, uh, and we grew the company from about two hundred million to about two and a half billion in my time wow. there. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's Meluca. Did they manufacture the product themselves? We did everything okay. A to Z. R&D, manufacturing, um, distribution, yeah. marketing, the whole thing, A to Z. And you were chief, the chief strategy officer. I started as C, chief operating officer. Okay. Then I became the president of international. So I started the businesses in China, Japan, Hong Kong, 18 countries, mostly wow. Asia. And then became the president of the company 2009. 2009. Yeah. And are you still involved in, in Melaleuca? Yeah, part owner, and I'm still a senior advisor and board member. Got it. Yeah. Wow. So what, what is, what would you say are some of the, the biggest things you learned throughout that 18 year, you know, experience at Melaleuca? Um, maybe one or two war stories or, you know, learning, uh, learning points that we could, we could gauge from your, your experience. I learned a lot about, um, uh, how to do business strategically, how to apply strategy to business. You know, too often people say the word strategy, they just want to sound smart and they're not quite sure what it means. Mm -hmm. But the word strategy actually comes from strategos and it means the art of the general. And it, it is how you win in the marketplace against others. 
and the strategies that we create really are to that end. So one of the things that we did exceptionally well was we considered the value chain. Value chain is all of the activities that happen from designing a product all the way up until when you give it to the end consumer. And there's a million steps there that include acquisition, supply chain, manufacturing, et cetera. And what Amazon, for example, did brilliantly was they cut out steps in that value chain. You know, when they were competing in books originally with Am- with Barnes & Noble, Barnes & Noble was still having the retail model. Amazon eliminated it. And as a result, they've created a new business model, and it's been hugely successful for them. Well, we did the same thing at Melaleuca. We eliminated the need for advertising because of referral marketing. Mm-hmm. We were shopping. Consumers were shopping direct. We introduced memberships. And as a result, it was a huge success for us, and we competed against the Proctors and Gambles of the world. My biggest war story is... When I was asked to be president of international, uh, China was the big opportunity, and I knew nothing about China. Mm. So I got uh, uh, in the on the plane, went out, landed on the ground in Shanghai, and said, "All right, guess I got to go to work." And started to network with lawyers and others who knew the market, trying to figure out what we needed to do. Well, China's weird. You have to manufacture in China to sell the product. You have to have licensing in every district. That means every districts are small, like mm. cities. Oh, wow. So not just a province, but in every district. And where you go to get the license in the district isn't to some district office. You go to the police station. Mm. And when you go to the police station and say, here's our manufacturing, here's our goods, here's our, we're, you know, we're meeting all these requirements. Well, the policeman would often say, all right, so... Uh, my daughter needs a job. She just graduated from college. Or he'd have his hand out over here and say, you know, I just, I've got this mortgage, you know, and it's really hurting me bad, you know. And as a result, when we refused to do that, you couldn't get your licensing done. Oh my gosh. So I heard that the the, uh, deputy director of commerce was coming here for a conference to the United States. Now this is number three in China. Okay, in the Chinese government. Okay, got it. I wiggled my way in to sit next to him during one session of the conference, and I, it was me sitting next to his aide sitting next to him. Okay. And during the conference, every time there was a comment, I would pull something out of my binder, and I'd hand it to, the, to his aide and say, here's what we do, and I'd show him. Well, when the session was over, he came up to me, introduced himself. We talked for a while, and he said, can I have your package of papers and book there? And I said, you bet. So I gave it to him and said, if you have any questions, any time, if we can help, call me. So when I ran into these roadblocks months later, I called on the phone and said, hey, I'm having these roadblocks. I'd really like to meet with them. And the aide got back to me and said, be ready. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll call you a few days in advance, but you need to be available when he's available. So I got a phone call. They wanted to meet with me. Nine o'clock in the morning on Thursday. It was Tuesday, but they're fourteen hours ahead. So I had to jump on a plane right there to get oh, right wow. then to get there. I landed at six in the morning, went to my room, showered, got down to the lobby. I'm supposed to be in the lobby in Beijing across from the office. And I'm waiting for him at nine o'clock. He doesn't show up. Finally I get a message at eleven. He's in a meeting. He'll come over at noon. He doesn't show up. I get another message. He'll be here. We just don't know when. Five o'clock, six o'clock. Mm. At three in the morning. He, he shows up. Now, I sat in the lobby wow. from 8 in the morning till 3 in the morning. He shows up, and I'm apologizing. Like, you don't need to be here. You need to be home in bed. Uh, we can do this over the phone. I'm, I really, and he says, no. He sat down. We talked for 90 minutes. Oh, my goodness. He talked to me about his family, his career. He was like, it was awesome. I told him my problem. He said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And we never had a problem getting a license in the district after that. That's amazing. Yeah. So do you speak Chinese or do you have no, a translator? No, I speak Japanese. Okay. He, he had perfect English. Okay, so they can speak, okay, they he, can speak he, English. He could speak perfect English. That's good. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. I, I didn't appreciate the nuances of, of doing business out well, in China. That's, it's, it's, a, it's radically different. Yeah. From, you know, if you look at Volkswagen, for example, they had to build manufacturing plants throughout the country uh, in order just to sell their cars in the country and comply with one regulation after another, after another. You try to repatriate capital, very difficult. I mean, it's just a tough place to do business. Wow. That's great. Well, McKay, I'd say, you know, you are an incredible example of somebody who, you know, went to school, got an MBA, 
multiple master's degrees and have built an incredible career within you know companies um i guess the term might be like entrepreneur where you are establishing ownership presence by working with a company and having tenure there over over years whereas um you know a lot of people look at school or at least in kind of the entrepreneurial world like hey why, why do i need to go to college uh why do i should i go work for a big company I mean, guess what, what would you say, you know, to people who are on the fence about school or on the fence about why don't I just go, you know, start this drop shipping company or e-commerce brand or whatever it may be. What's kind of been your experience in, in going down a little bit more of a, I guess, a traditional route um, and where you are today versus some, some routes that other people are looking at? All right. Let me talk school first and then entrepreneurial. Yeah. So. There's this famous Japanese saying that is ino naka no kawazu to kaio shudazu. And it means a frog in a well cannot conceive of the ocean. In other words, you can't be what you can't see. Let me give you a perfect example of the power of this principle. Let's say your nine-year-old son, uh, you had a vision one day. You absolutely knew for certain that he was going to grow up to be a world-renowned heart surgeon. How would you treat him? Like a, like a surgeon with potential, you know, like a little guy with potential to be a surgeon, right? Exactly. And when he failed his first science test? You'd say it's going to be okay. Right? It's going to be <laughs> no, all right. No problem. Yeah. Exactly. Because you can see what you can be. Mm. School does a number of things. You gotta, I'm biased because I teach business strategy at the Merritt School. Mm -hmm. But school does a number of things. And one of the things it does exceptionally well is it gives you a view and the view that it often gives you is the view of you. Meaning if you'll jump into school and approach it with sucking the marrow out of it and learning all you can, you'll try on one perspective after another. And you'll decide, is that perspective one I want to adopt or not? And soon you'll have left the well of the frog, so to speak, and you'll have stood on the summit of several different types of things and people and views and perspectives and they'll be yours. They'll become yours. Now, can you get that another way? Sure. Can you get that in as short a time as a good program in school? I don't think so. Mm. So when people talk to me about school, that's, that's one of my arguments. Now you got to yeah. remember while I was president at Mel Luca, I went back and got my PhD while I was working. So I'm a school believer. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of job and being an entrepreneur, uh, I don't think that the classical go work for a large company is always the right path. It rarely is, in fact. Not very many people do it. And I do think that there's life and passion and beauty and, and learning to be had in the entrepreneurial effort. Some of the best things I learned were from my own businesses where I tried to do what you did and tried to do a large development, right? Um, uh, there's just, there's just life there, right? There's just experience and there's joy and your mind's working and, and you're, you're meeting people and you're learning how to do things you've never done before. That's, that's awesome. So I, I, I would say I'm not sure about the big company path or the entrepreneurial path mm -hmm. because there's so much beauty uh, and joy and learning in that entrepreneurial path. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, there really is. Um, I, I'm a school advocate, but not necessarily the large company advocate. Interesting. Yeah, and, and I've had struggles with this concept as well myself because I, I came out of BYU, did the accounting program, and as you're aware, right, it's, it's very much... Um, and I agree with your point completely. I took entrepreneurship classes where you had different speakers who'd come in and say, you know, I did this, or you'd hear from a partner at a big four accounting firm and they'd say, I did this path or that path. So yeah, hundred percent agree. Great exposure at school, really a great place to learn, to work hard, to establish relationships, to get um, organized to so many other soft skills other than the curriculum that you can develop going to going to school. Um, but I, to your point, I've struggled with that a lot because I went and left BYU to work for, you know, JP Morgan as kind of corporate as you could get um, and, and then transitioned to another role that was somewhat similar um, and, and always had the thought, I, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to be an entrepreneur. But the, the struggle is you get the golden handcuffs a little bit where you're getting a, a nice paycheck, an annual bonus, you got the benefits. And 
I feel like the longer you stay, the harder it can be to make that transition. And so what I've seen at least recently is a lot of people kind of make that decision either while they're at school or shortly thereafter. I think the, the longer you you stay, the harder it gets, although you get more and more experience. So it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. And I, I agree. I, I don't really know what the what the exact answer is or what the <laughs> – it probably just depends on timing and, and what you want to do and, and all of that. But So I'm 58 years old. I've been through a lot of things in life. I've made a lot of choices, a lot of choices. If I look back over my life and look at the choices that I regret, I never regret the choices that were really bold, mm. that were the big choices. And a lot of them led to disastrous outcomes, but I don't regret one of them. I do regret the choices that I didn't take that bolder action. Yeah. And I think that's a reasonable blueprint for making choices. I mean, it, you've got to take, yeah, you got to have the right calcul calculation and it can't be, you know, overly, uh, overly dangerous, but bold choices give you an education, right? Right. Yeah. I've heard you at the end of your life, you will regret more of the things you didn't do than the things that you, you did. And that is so wrong. true. So that is so true. And I do think that we take the safe path sometimes mm -hmm. because, you know, there's this huge thing in psychology called the status quo bias. And uh, it, the story that they often tell is this. Profe uh, years ago, a, a, a pretty large company did a study with professional golfers, and they examined 6 to 12-foot putts. And what they found is the professional golfers facing a 6 to 12-foot putt for par hit that putt almost twice as often as a 6 to 12-foot putt for birdie. Mm. Now, why is that? You see, because what they concluded was that professional golfers have this built in, um, you know, energy and, and, and passion about not scoring a bogey. It's odd because they're both worth the same point, right? But they don't have it as much for the birdie. And those that can learn to hit the putts for birdie, they estimated for the average professional golfer would yield about $1.2 million more a year oh, wow. if they had the same success rate on birdie putts. The other story is that. If you take a look at insurance rates across the country, um, Michigan, uh, Montana, New Jersey have the highest car insurance rates. Michigan, because they have, they require full coverage uh, on everything. Uh, Montana, because you have the highest fatalities per accident. Mm. New Jersey has the most accidents. And so the legislators in New Jersey put together a way to cut insurance rates by limiting the amount that you could sue someone for if you were in an accident and they put it out there uh, and it was surprisingly hardly anybody wanted the new insurance mm. and they studied it and realized oh it wasn't the fact that that you you had less liability that you could go after it was that people loved the status quo mm. and they didn't want to change from the status quo so both of those principles working together it's built into us the the status quo, to take the safe path, to take the structured path, right? And what's not built into us is to choose that bold choice that you've been talking about. Uh, and you could call that the entrepreneurial choice if you wanted. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, why some people don't choose it is because they have a status quo bias. Yeah, that's, I love it. I love, I mean, you being a PhD, McKay, and I, we'll get into your podcast here in a second, but just having that educational twist on everything and the, the examples you use in the stories. It's, it's, it's great, man. Um, I want to talk about Thanksgiving points. So for, for those who aren't aware, uh, in terms of listeners, I, so I live in Lehigh Thanksgiving point. It's, it's an awesome amenity to the community. There's a, a museum and there's a movie theater and activities and all sorts of things. So how, how did, um, how did that come about? I mean, you're the CEO of Thanksgiving points, a pretty unique role. I feel like what, what has that been like? About a decade ago, uh, my wife and I said, we want to change our careers and start focusing on giving back. So we stepped aside from uh, my present role. And the first thing I did was I started teaching school. And then I was asked by BYU to be the managing director of advancement there. And we just decided to give the rest of our life to roles that we're giving back to our community. So after I did the BYU gig, this opportunity came up and I told Alan and Karen Ashton, who founded Thanksgiving Point, hey, I'll come and help run this nonprofit. And it's been a great experience. Uh, and 
it really is a remarkable collection of things. Like you said, we have museums and and after school programs and homeschool programs and children's museums and gardens and all sorts of things going on. And it serves as a center for the community. But our focus is to help uh, double disadvantaged kids in the state of Utah. So we do uh, scholarship programs. Any family, any kid whose family is on WIC and SNAP benefits can come to our any of our anything there for free. Oh, wow. Uh, and we do outreach into the more disadvantaged areas in our state to help kids learn about science, gain learning skills, gain critical thinking skills. And so every dollar that we make in profit, we turn around and use for our nonprofit mission. Uh, and I, we get a chance to, we have about 700 employees who are engaged in that effort, about the same number of volunteers who serve on our property. And we're all committed to that cause. And it's an awesome thing. That's amazing. I actually didn't realize until the, until this you know, research and podcast that, that it was a not more of a nonprofit organization, which is uh, is great. So going there, every dollar you spend is is going towards something good. Exactly, which is great, and and going to be uh, more uh, more motivation for us to go there more often with our four year old. <laughs> Come over two, all the time. Year old. Get over there. Um, are there are there volunteer opportunities for for people over there? Or there do you guys have any uh, organized volunteer? stuff that goes on all the time you can go to our website at yeah. thanksgivingpoint.org and just go to the volunteer section sign up we'll bring you in we'll get you trained we'll get you put to work and uh, it's a great place for people who just want to spend a few hours a week giving back to their community it's one of the most organized volunteer programs in the state i love it that's yeah. great so yeah for anyone listening who wants to, to go and, and volunteer please please check that out <clears throat> um I, I read, I read, McKay, that you had done a lot of seminars and trainings throughout your career. So has that been, um, it sounds like an organized uh, process. Is that, is that like an entrepreneurial thing that you had on the side where you were going out and doing, doing seminars? Maybe walk us through what that, that's been like. Yeah, about a decade ago, I had done a lot of trainings throughout my career and, and, uh, and things. And I wrote a book and as a result, uh, was asked to come and do a lot of public speaking. And I thought that will be a side gig for the rest of my life to, mm -hmm. to travel the country, do public speaking and do seminars. And uh, I've done several uh, and done a lot of public speaking. After three or four years of that, I realized that isn't uh, as much fun as it's <laughs> cracked up to be. Yeah. Uh, and I still do it. I just don't charge as I charge now and then, but I don't charge, you know, the 10 or $15,000 of speech that I used to. Okay. Nice. Uh, and, and I, and I'm selective about what I do, but I've kind of taken the attitude now, I just want to help. And if, like I said, mentioned words before, if the words that I share can help people um, see that they have potential uh, and see that they can achieve something different in life, uh, then I want to help do that. You know, the great NC State basketball coach Jimmy Valvano famously said, God must have loved ordinary people because he made so many of us. But every day in every walk of life, Ordinary people do extraordinary things. Mm. And I believe that. I believe that each yeah. of us are endowed with gifts uh, that uh, we can use in this world for good. And it's up to us to find those gifts and then to see how we can use them to help other people. Uh, and if uh, my speaking or learning or training is one of those gifts and I can use that for good, then that's what I want to do. I love it. That's amazing. Um, you talked about a couple other entrepreneurial ventures that failed or you've tried or that you're currently doing. So apart from, you know, Melaleuca and, and the, the seminars, what other you know things have you tried or failed at or succeeded in? Well, I've done real estate. Everybody's got to do real estate, right? <laughs> so, at least once, yeah. So I, I tried and failed at a lot of real estate. I did a 250 uh, home development uh another 60 acre development. I learned that the sweet spot for me was um, just doing what everybody does, which is uh, I have a good collection of rentals that have been great residual income for me. And I have a staff that takes care of it. Nice. Uh, and they do a great job. But I late made a lot of mistakes along the way, chose to partner with wrong people, didn't do due diligence like I should. Uh, time, bad timing. Economy caught me in 2008 and nine. Mm. You know, I had a lot of good learning experiences over that time. Uh, uh, so that's one of my side ventures. The other side venture is uh, writing and speaking, podcasting. I do that more to give back than anything else. And I've had a few other investments and endeavors along the way, but uh, that's not any more than most other people do. Yeah, awesome. 
Love it. Well, t- touching on your, your podcast, uh, Open Your Eyes, tell us a little bit about the, the purpose of that. Um, I've been listening to it in the last couple of weeks in preparation for this, but would love to, to kind of hear you know, what the vision is there and, and why you're doing it. During my PhD, and then after my PhD, in conjunction with Hiram Smith, who was a, just a great man and a great speaker, uh, founder of Fr- Fr- you know, Franklin Covey, co-founder there, um, started to refine the concept of belief window. Uh, and I believe that we all have one. So imagine that coming out of the back of your head is a bracket, and this bracket extends up over the front of your eyes and hangs in front of your face and, and your eyes. You look through this window throughout the day, everywhere you look, left, right, up, down. Uh, this, this lens is continually in front of you. And each day through our belief window, we get millions of pieces of input of data. When we interact with each other, when we listen, when we read, when we think about ourselves, we're always interpreting and trying to make meaning of things. And based on what's on our belief window, we'll either leave that to our unconscious or subconscious, or we'll consciously think about it. But there are biases and beliefs on our belief window that can dictate how we think about ourselves and other people and and the world and our place in it. So for example... Am I beautiful or ugly? Am I smart or dumb? Am I capable or not? We place belief windows on our belief window, uh, sometimes with erroneous data. For example, uh, my daughter, uh, when she was going to school, she went there and she was uh, starting to decide which classes to take and she didn't, wasn't signed up for an accounting class. So I said, well, why don't you take accounting? Mm. And she said, oh, dad, I, I, I'm not good at accounting. And I thought, well, I wonder... What belief on her belief window is there that's saying to her she's not good at accounting? And I said, well, why do you think you're not good at accounting? She said, because I never picked up math concepts very good, so I'm not good at accounting. Well, first, accounting doesn't have much to do with math. You add and subtract a little bit, but it's mostly language and categorization, right, Right. of business and how to speak the language of business. And, uh, And then second, all of us struggle with math concepts when we first meet them, right? Mm-hmm. So with a little bit of talking, she ended up taking her accounting class, and sure enough, she was good at it, and it changed what she was thinking about doing for a career. Mm. That happens to all of us all the time. We place beliefs on our belief window, or they're placed there for us, without realizing. You know, a few years ago, Tyler Vegan graduated from law school, and after he graduated from law school, he went on the search for twins. And not twins like you and I would think of them, but data set twins. For example, he found a huge correlation, a very high correlation between uh, per capita cheese consumption in the United States and the number of people who died in bed. Mm -hmm. Totally, but but almost a perfect correlation. Interesting. The most famous one that he found is a correlation between the number of people who drown in swimming pools and the number of Nicolas Cage movies released each year. Now, if you believe the correlation, you would say every time Nick Cage made a movie, people threw themselves into a pool and drowned themselves, right? Yeah. But we take correlations that are as just unrelated as that and place them on our own belief window about what we can or can't do or what we think or don't think, as ridiculous as those that happens to us all the time. So long answer to your question, but um, the podcast is to help us open our eyes, to place correct beliefs on our belief window, to see our potential, to challenge our way of thinking and to arm us with different ways of seeing ourselves in the world and how we can contribute to the world. And it is a daily task to change your belief window and have an accurate belief window is a daily march. You need to feed yourself with with the right facts and truth and challenge your thinking on an ongoing basis. And it does lead to one really important thing, and I believe is a happier life, greater peace, greater understanding. One last thing, a great Harvard professor once said, you can never change as long as you are subject to a thing. But when you can become object to that thing, meaning as long as you, if you have a habit, for example, that you're subject to all the time, Mm -hmm. you're never going to be able to change until you can step out, be object to it, and look at it like a camera or a third party and see yourself and your behavior and assess why you are in that situation and to be able to look at it objectively. And I think that we need that daily. We need to be able to challenge our perspectives and thinking on a regular basis. Hence why I do the podcast. 
I love it. I, I think listening to it and hearing you just now, right, break down these concepts um, in, in a layer deeper than most people appreciate or typically do, I think that's where you can really make a difference in, in your mindset and in your life. Um, because it's very easy to just go, go through life without even thinking about, you know, a belief window or being an object to or subject to a habit and, and not even really realize what's going on in your mind, in your mental state. But when you, when you kind of take a step back, like you explain in your podcast and you say, oh, this is objectively or, or, you know, conceptually why I am the way I am or why I think the way I, I do. Um, it's really powerful and it's been, it's been very helpful. One thing you talk about when one of the, the things that, that you mentioned is procrastination and kind of there's an episode you have called the murky middle. Um, and this is something that I mentioned, I was working in a, in a corporate gig for five, six years and wanted to do an entrepreneurial thing, wanted to quit my job, but it, it just seemed to never, um, be the right time uh, to do it. So it, maybe McKay, could you kind of hit on what, what you think about, you know, procrastination or kind of being in this middle ground where you're not making a decision, um, I think a lot of people would benefit from, from some insight there. We all have a shadow self. And the shadow self, Carl Jung said, is, is the things that impact us that we don't always think about, uh, like procrastination. You might think that you procrastinate. Let's say your goal is to lose some weight and get up every morning and exercise. But when the alarm goes off, you don't always do what you said you were going to do, right? Uh, and you might think that's just because you don't have will, or you're not as good as other people. Not true. That's deeper than that. If you examine your shadow self, for example, maybe when you've looked in the mirror at your image or at yourself over the years, you've said to yourself, man, I'm out of shape or whatever. And there's this anxiety, there's this stressor associated with it. So when the alarm goes off in the morning uh, and uh, you think to yourself, I've got to work out, all of those things that are in your subconscious that you drug along all those years are working against you. And it causes you when you think, oh, I got to get up in the morning, all of a sudden that anxiety rises up again and you just want peace. So how do you get peace? You turn, roll over, right? And you go back to sleep and forget about it. Yeah. Right? So your subconscious is actually working against you. So procrastination does have to do with will, yes, but it also has to do with understanding what's going on inside and how you can impact that, right? Mm -hmm. So someone once said, if you really want to move an elephant and your will, your mood is like an elephant, it's huge. And sometimes because of the things I just described, it's hard to move, right? How do you move an elephant? You clear the path, meaning you make the path so clear that the elephant can't go anywhere but down that path. So you structure your day, right? So how do you clear the path to get up early and exercise? Well, if your friend's out front to pick you up to go to the gym together, the path is clear, right? Yeah. If your gym clothes are already set out so you don't have an excuse, right? So there are things you can do to clear the path, and those things help you then overcome these weaknesses that we tend to have in our shadow self, our procrastination and other things, right? Yeah. I've also learned there's just a couple of things that I do to talk to myself and I've tried to teach them to other people. When you make a decision that you are going to do something, that's usually pretty easy because it's in the time of emotion. But when emotion is passed, to have the integrity to do what you said you were going to do is sometimes pretty difficult, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what I've learned is that there's this 60 to 90 day span where you've just got to do one thing. And that is you put your head down, you stick with your plan, no matter how difficult. And what I say to myself during that time is it's not voting day. I don't get to stand up on Thursday and say, do I feel good? Is this really, is this fun? Do I like it? Is it passionate? Am I passionate about it? Because you're not going to, because it's usually going to be hard and you failed or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I've decided there's only voting day at day 90. At day 90, I'm giving myself permission to put my head up out of the sand and say, is this working? But until day 90, I'm not going to do that because every, anyone who tries to do something remarkable and they're, good, they're just starting out at it will fail. It will not feel good. And if you take, if voting day is every day, pretty soon you're going to talk yourself out of it or procrastination is going to start in yeah. because of anxiety and stressors. And, and then you're only going to be half-hearted. And if you try anything half-hearted, it's not going to work, right? Right. So wholehearted for 90 days, centered. 
every all your might, mind, strength. You're centered. This principle of centering I've taught, which is when you do a task during your day, do it with everything, your full whole energy and attention. And if you schedule your day like that, one hour segments or 45 minute segments where everything, no cell phone, everything is in the thing that you're doing. You'll get so much more done during the day. There's power and wholeheartedness, right? 90 days, wholehearted, all in everything you've got. And then you can vote at a particular time. So I'd say no voting day. The last thing I'd say is I teach my kids this principle and it is on anything difficult or scary, um, we want to think about it, assess it, and analyze it rather than just jump in and get it done, mm -hmm. right? And I've tried to develop the habit of do it now with them. And I tell them this story years ago when I was a kid, we went to Lake Powell. And you got a cliff jump if you go to Lake, Lake Powell, right? And my, and my friends and I were there, and we climbed up to the top of this cliff, and it was we hung down a 75-foot ski rope, and it was just barely touching the water. Mm -hmm. So this was the talk. It's a big one. And uh, you could break some bones. Yeah. And... Uh, and uh, I stood up there and I just thought, there's no way. So I turned around, I was walking back because I was too afraid to try. And my friends came running the other direction and they didn't, they didn't even stop. They just kept running right off the cliff and, and wow. jumped. And so I went over the cliff and I walked down about 10 feet, got a little lower, scooched down on my backside, you know, got down there and finally just counted to myself one, two, three and jumped. And since then, uh, and I was fine. Uh, since then, I've learned the, that one, two, three. It works. It really does. When you talk to yourself and you just get in the habit, your brain gets in the habit of when you say one, two, three, you go. You get home, you don't want to do something, you know you have to do it, it'll only take five minutes, one, two, three, go. Procrastination uh, can be offset, can be neutralized by triggers like that that you learn to give yourself uh, to cause yourself to act. Wow. I think there's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. That's in, That's... <laughs> That was great. Um, completely agree. And like I said before, most people would think of procrastination as I'm just lazy or I have no willpower. But when you break it down like that into the, these negative emotions that have built up over years related to that thing and the triggers and developing a path, uh, I think that's that's incredible. Be surprised um, at how much mood dictates our life. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, if you can be object to the mood and see it, and have things in your life to counteract it. It's powerful. And I'll say, I feel most confident, kind of going back to procrastination, you know, you never really feel confident after you procrastinate. <laughs> you know, I, I said I was going to do something, but then I didn't do it. I feel the most confident when I say, I'm going to do something, and then I, I do do it. And even if it's small, you know, little wins uh, throughout the day, and, and, and specifically never setting myself up to fail. It's like, hey, let's, let's, do this in small bits or let's carve out an hour to be able to accomplish this task. Um, and little wins like that can help, I think, reestablish confidence and, and good habits. Action reestablishes confidence. Yeah, I love it. Well, um, this has been awesome, McKay. I think two, two questions left for you that I've got. Um, one would be, what advice would you have to, for, to give to somebody who um, is looking to, you know, start a business or maybe it's create a, create a new venture or take a risk. Um, and, and they're, they're on the fence or have, have been delaying that. I mean, kind of going into this procrastination conversation again, but what advice would you give to that, that individual? Years ago, um, Jack Welch, uh, really an entrepreneur in, in some ways, the great CEO of the conglomerate GE, uh, was speaking at Harvard business school. And at the end of his speech, he had talked to the students there. He was doing Q&A. And he said, it'll take one last question. And a, uh, a woman stood up and she said, okay, now we're all in business here and we want to succeed. And, and what advice would you give us? And he said two things. And they're the same things that I would say to the people that you're talking about mm -hmm. who really want to break out and do something remarkable. And they've made a decision to pursue something. And there's a big challenge ahead of them. He said, first, you've got to decide if business is your thing. You really have to decide. And I'd say the same thing. If whatever you've chosen, whatever entrepreneurial uh, effort that you've chosen or business that you've chosen to start, <clears throat> you have to really decide, is it your thing? 
Can you be deeply passionate about it? And will it drive your economic engine? <coughs> Excuse me. Once you've decided, he's, he then said, and if you decide that business is your thing, then don't dabble. And I'd say the same thing. So many people make a decision and then they dabble. And they never know if it really is their thing or not because you'll never know while you're dabbling. It'll never tell you anything about yourself. It'll never tell you anything about the proposition. It'll never tell you anything about the business. Don't dabble. I love it. Get out there and get after it. Last question for you, McKay. How do you define success in your life? I adopted someone else's definition. So I didn't come up with this on my own, but when I learned it, it sunk deep into me and I've kept it ever since. So Clayton Christensen wrote this great book called How Will You Measure Your Life? It's an awesome book. Um, and as he tells the story about how it came about, he attended his uh, Harvard uh, reunion decades after he graduated from Harvard Business School. And uh, there were all sorts of successful CEOs, entrepreneurs, and others there at his reunion. And what he saw was that not very many of them were very happy. And it caused him to start to contemplate on, wow, we all went to school and thought we'd measure our life by, the, you know, how successful we were in business and other things. And he realized that isn't the measure. So what is the, how will we measure our life? What is the measure? At the same time, he was having experiences in the other, another experience in his life where he thought that he was going to have a certain position and he didn't get that position. And it rocked his world because he was hoping that circumstance would make him happy and it would be his path in life. And then all of a sudden it wasn't there and he didn't, you know, it kind of rocked his world a mm -hmm. little bit. And as he pondered and contemplated, he came to this conclusion. And the conclusion is that how you will measure your life is how you serve in your circumstance. So what that means is your circumstances can change. You might be a CEO. You might not be. You might be an entrepreneur. You might not be. You may have succeeded. You might not. But that doesn't really dictate how you measure your life. It's how you served in that circumstance. And it's how you serve in your current circumstance. And I do believe that God gives us seasons in our life and or life does, whoever gives us seasons in our life. And in those seasons, we have an opportunity to serve in that particular situation for a period of time. And that there is a purpose in our being there. Uh, and I've decided that the success in life is exactly that. Whatever season you've been given right now in your life, whatever circumstances, family, business, whatever else, you ha there's a purpose for you in that season. Sir, it's how you will serve in that circumstance. Will you make the people in that circumstance better? Will you emerge from that season with them being better because you were part of it? Will you have put yourself a little bit less than the others around you? Well, you have been a model, an example. We could go on, but it's how you serve in the circumstance that will really matter at the end of the day. I love that. That's that's incredible and something that I I need to work on a lot. And and I we I all do that. There's no nothing nothing really else to add to that, McKay. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's, it's been so much fun, and you uh, are are just incredible from your education and, and your experience and being able to share some of that with our audience. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this podcast. I know it takes time and it is a service to the world. And, uh, it's just admirable that you're taking the time out of your life and, and, and efforts to put this together for the good of other people. So thanks for doing it. Of course. And, and for anyone listening, go check out McKay's podcast, open your eyes. And it's, it's incredible as we've discussed. So Thanks, McKay. Appreciate Thank you. Time. Glad right. to be here. Thanks for listening to The Chase Hudson Show. If you liked what you heard, please leave me a review and subscribe to this podcast. Reviews really help us to find better guests and to improve the overall quality of the show. If you'd like to connect with me directly or want to learn more about investing in real estate, send me a DM on Instagram at official Chase Hudson. Again, we really appreciate you listening and we'll talk to you on the next episode.